This program is made possible in part by the Maryland Arts Council through the State of Maryland and the National Endowment for the Arts and the Howard County Arts Council through a grant from Howard County Government. Welcome to Hoko Polizzo's The Writing Life. I am Tara Hart, and I'm honored to be here with three very distinguished novelists. We have Donna Hemmons, the author of River Woman and the forthcoming Voices from the Sea, Thridi Umagar, the author of If Today Be Sweet, Bombay Time, The Space Between Us, a memoir called First Darling of the Morning, and your forthcoming novel, The Weight of Heaven. Helen Elaine Lee, author of Serpent's Gift, Watermarked, and the forthcoming novel, Life Without. Welcome, all of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Some of your characters in your novels seem to grope their way through day by day. Um, they react to events as they occur, and they, and they do their best, while others seem to try to follow a, a script or vision of the way that they imagine their life might be. And I was wondering how you all have found your way into your own successful writing process. Um, what have been your challenges? Your stories have obviously found their way into the world, so you are very successful. Um, so it, maybe we could talk a little bit about that. Donna? It, you know, it, it changes so much. You know, with River Woman, I, at the time I began writing River Woman, I was working as a journalist um, in New York, and I knew that I needed a community around me in order to write that book because I'd never written a novel. I'd written short stories, but I had just never tackled a novel. And so I applied for an MFA program, got into a program here in the DC area, American University, and wrote that novel as my thesis. Mm -hmm. And the process has been different with each book, but one thing that has worked for me is having a having a community, having a group mm -hmm. of writers who I can can talk to about writing about, you know, different things that I stumble up mm -hmm. on and people who will read my work and give some kind of feedback. And that's the one thing that has been constant throughout because everything else has changed. Um, and I imagine that it will continue to change because as a writer, if I know too much about what it is that is coming or what I'm doing, I don't mm -hmm. think I would enjoy writing as much as I do. Mm -hmm. Pretty. Um, I think the biggest challenge for me is time, just finding the time um, to mm -hmm. write. Right. And um, I was lucky when I wrote my first novel, Bombay Time, I was lucky in that I had applied for a Neiman Fellowship to Harvard. Mm -hmm. And although that came with you know, its own set of responsibilities, mm -hmm. I was sort of removed from the daily grind of you know, going to work. Mm -hmm. I too was a journalist and um, you know, there's no nine to five when right. you're a reporter. Um, and that gave me a block of time, which was a really precious gift. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, it's not a gift that I've been able to replicate or repeat. Um, <laughs> so every other book has just been a balancing act between, mm -hmm. you know, I still have a day job. I'm a professor at a university now. Mm -hmm. And um, what I find myself doing is just getting up earlier and earlier in the mm -hmm. mornings when I'm writing a book. So, you know, the first two weeks I might set the alarm for six and then it moves to 5.30 and then it moves to five <laughs> and that's just how it goes. And uh, it actually becomes easier because when you really are sort of halfway through a book and really into it, you know, there's nothing else that you'd rather do with your life at that mm -hmm. point. You're so obsessed with the book. And then sort of the sacrifices that you make seem minuscule, you know, for, mm -hmm. compared to the rewards that you yeah. get. I know you all admire Toni Morrison and I think it was she who said that at a certain point she had to strip her life down just to uh, two things, her children and her writing, right, yeah. in order to, in order right. to get yeah, it done. Right. Yeah. Helen? Um, it is that balancing act between teaching, mothering, mm -hmm. daughtering, all, all, the, all the daily demands of, mm. of living. Um, I used to really struggle for discipline. It seemed like writing came hard and I would I had my various ways of uh, making a bridge, you know, into mm. it, and I still do. I still garden to try to get in a place where I could listen or be or be still. Or, 
or listen to music, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but there, there was a major shift uh, for me when I had a child, and I'm a single mother, so it, you know it's all on me. And uh, I no longer struggle for discipline because I, I guess I understood <laughs> that if I didn't do it every moment I could do it, it would never, yes. right. it would never get done. So I don't know. I just sit down and now whenever, mm -hmm. whenever uh, you know I'm free, I sit mm -hmm. down and I, and I make it happen. I just. I don't know, it's kind of mysterious, but right. it, it just, I do it, you know. Yeah. And even if it's just an hour, then I find some task I can do that's, that's an hour long task. Mm. I guess this, the real challenge is being uh, still enough and quiet enough and mm. in order to be immersed. Mm. And, and, you know, sure. that does sort of take blocks of time. Like if you're really right. imagining the story or reimagining, mm -hmm. you know, through, through revising the story that you have, then you can't quite do that in an hour here and right. an hour there. And yet, I think you're absolutely right that, that this thing of like not leaving any moment to go to waste, I yeah. think, is really crucial. I mean, some days you might just write 15 minutes and, you know, mm -hmm. get a page. And that's, that's just how that day is going to turn out for you, and it's the best yeah. you can do. Yeah. You know, or so. polish something, or, polish, or yeah, think about a problem that you yeah. have. Yeah, go really back to yeah. what you've written the day before and just, you know, correct mm -hmm. a few mm -hmm. things in it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's, that's what your day's worth that day. But, um, yeah. Uh, I, and, and this is something that you know readers always say. You know, every person says they have a story in them, and mm -hmm. I think that's true at some very deep level. Um, but people always talk about, I just don't have the time. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and you know the fact is we don't have the time either. Mm -hmm. uh, we make the time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and yeah. I think that's the difference between people who say they want to write yes. and people who write is that mm -hmm. commitment that you make to yourself. Yeah. 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 And it seems that you carry it out in the world with you. Um, I know yesterday we did a workshop with students and, and one of the recommendations was carrying a journal or paying attention right. to things you overhear. Mm -hmm. uh, Thridi, I think you've said, you know, write in the shower right. if, <laughs> if that works for you. Yeah. So you're, it's always with you and it's not Absolutely. reserving it for these Absolutely. I do my best moments. writing in the shower. I'm not ashamed <laughs> of it, you know. I mean, there have been times when I've actually tried putting clipboards in the shower. It's just that I've never found one that, you know, stay up. that would stay up and the water wouldn't just... Uh, but I've actually gone to those kinds of lengths, you know, just to jot down ideas and yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, Donna, you mentioned um, the, the supportive power of community in, in right. your writing process. Right. And I think when um, people approach a book written by a woman, they might expect that it's going to be about the affirming power of communities and mm. connections. And yet, I'm struck in all of your work about how communities can also be incredibly destructive uh, forces. And I wonder if we could think about that a little bit, um, about that, that mm -hmm. negative communal power, if, yeah. if you will. Mm -hmm. well, that's a Toni Morrison thing, isn't mm -hmm. it? I mean, the, the, the community whether it's in the love it or right. solar or, you know, mm -hmm. or the blue sky has the has the capacity to reject and mm -hmm. scapegoat and, yes. and all that but then even in beloved even after after it scapegoats mm -hmm. it, it that, ultimate, that community banishes the ghost right, right. right. So, right. so i mean i think that's you know those both potentials are there yeah yeah well, I think to us writers, we are we are reflecting what happens in in our societies, mm -hmm. and I mean, even if you go back to you know the first grade or um, kindergarten, mm -hmm. we form communities yes. and we you know push people out, and it's something that stays with us throughout. And mm -hmm. I think as writers, we we are writing about what we either see mm -hmm. or feel or experience, or in some cases, what we would not like to see. Mm -hmm. But you know, we are all a part of a community, and sure. you know that's what we mm -hmm. write about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and to some extent, one could argue that community is, is based on the principle of exclusion, right? I mean, right. how do you mm. define yourself as a community? It's this is who we are, which this implies we this is what we are not, right. you know? Right. So, so that negative mm -hmm. is perhaps even built into the very mm -hmm. concept of community. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Is I was it, thinking too that um, and with your thing about um, where you belong and home, mm -hmm. I mean, belonging is about place, but it's also about, right. about that, right? Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Yeah. Very much mm -hmm. so. Yeah. 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 Is it gendered? Um, I know in the media there's the talk of mean girls and mm -hmm. the ways that women do this as if it is specific mm -hmm. uh, to women in the way that they exclude. Is that something that you've thought about or is it just a human? Mm -hmm. I think it's human. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, you know, there are some things that um, roles that women are forced into and so mm -hmm. we begin to look at things as, as if it's gendered. Um, you know, there are lots of places where, you know, especially in River Women, women gather at the, ri the river to wash clothes. Yes. But 
that's not something that should be relegated only to women. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it is gender just because that's the way we have been trained to look at just about everything in our lives. Right. It's um, either a woman's job or a man's job or mm -hmm. it's something that a woman shouldn't do or a man shouldn't mm -hmm. do. And, you know, I think, you know, we're all trying to break down some of those rules because that's what we writers do. We break rules mm -hmm. or we try to make our own if, right. you know, mm -hmm. if, if we can. Yeah. So, you know, it's... Um, we make it up as we go along. Yeah. <laughs> I do think women, there is a pitch though, an emotional mm. pitch and intensity, you know, to the way that women uh, interact and because right. we are raised to be, you know, relational. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There's, uh, so, so maybe when you have that, that mm. power, I mean, it's mm. both, it, again, as with, with any community, it's a source of power and it's also, right, I suppose, right. can be dangerous mm -hmm. or yeah. scarier. And yeah. I think perhaps a way of reframing that question is to not think of it so much in terms of gender, but just in terms of power, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, who, uh, you know, communities that are powerless uh, and communities that have power. Right. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, the powerless, unfortunately, all over the world, you know, are forced to compete against each other. And yeah. sometimes these tensions mm -hmm. that we see between mm -hmm. women, you know, um, are just really lack of opportunities, right. you know. Right. So it right. does become, I think you said, the crabs in the barrel energy. Mm -hmm. And right. I think right. uh, that's something to keep in mind, that these mm -hmm. stereotypes exist, uh, you know, about women being catty or being, but they are being pitted against each other yes. in some sense. Mm -hmm. so, yes. uh, so I'm I'm more interested in sort of just defining community based on, you know, who has power and who doesn't. Yes, you know. the, the whole system. Yeah. 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 Yes. Um, the, uh, a lot of people have talked about the mother-daughter relationships in, in all of your books, and I think, again, the, the, the community is so important there because it seems to influence a mother as she tries to teach her daughter about how she moves in the world or her hair or her body or, um, uh, you know, uh, food. And um, so I was going to uh, provide an opportunity for us to hear some of your prose. And I'd like to ask each of you to read a passage in your works that has to do something with, with food or drink or sustenance. You know, uh, eating is something we all do and we all have, we all watch each other do it and we have rules about how we do it. And it's something that can just be eating or uh, might represent something else. It might be about control mm -hmm. or sensuality um, or too messy or, or all of those things. So um, I was hoping that if, if, we, if we hear these passages, we may be able to talk about the connections uh, and their, their meaning. Mm -hmm. oh. Sure. Um, you know, um, in River Woman, this young woman is left behind by her mother for 15 years, and her mother comes back during, after her son, after her grandson drowns. And so the section I'm going to read is about this daughter trying to win her mother back, and mm -hmm. she's trying to use food to do it. Mm. To get my mother back, I must lose my son. Last night, I fixed, my ba fixed her bath water, as warm as I used to make it for Timothy, the way she must have done for me so long ago. She didn't have to lift the basin either. I took it to the bathroom, and when she was done, I washed the tub down. Tomorrow, I'll do as Graham says and fix the porridge the way my mother likes it. Not thick, lumpy cornmeal porridge, smooth, creamy banana porridge, nutmeg grated on top, brown sugar sprinkled on top. That's the way Timothy liked it too, with buttered hard dough bread, the edges cut off. There's boiled bananas and ackee for lunch, callaloo if she doesn't want ackee. I'll make cabbage or corned beef, whatever she wants, for dinner, pea soup or oxtail, or something she hasn't had in a long time, something I know she can't get over there. She doesn't like Horlicks anymore. Timothy didn't like the malt drink either. But she drinks hot cocoa when Gramps boils it and warm Myla with lots of condensed milk when I make it. Gramps says she used to like bread pudding and sweet potato pone. And I remember how my mother used to break the bread into tiny bits or grate the bread fine and pour sweetened milk over it, mixing the bread to a lumpy, creamy batter. We ate the pudding hot, soft and squishy, almost all of it at once. When I find some time, I'll make some for her. And so I think what we see here is this daughter, in a way, becoming a mother, because mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what she's been missing, mm -hmm. and that's what she has always wanted in you know, her life. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Makes me hungry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who would like to go next, Rudy or Helen? Sure. Um, 
the passage that I want to read is, is actually, it's a communal feast uh, that's, mm -hmm. that's occurring in this um, tiny Indian village that, that the two main American characters find themselves mm -hmm. in and they are guests there. Um, and I think this passage says a little bit about, um, you know, Ellie's sort of openness to different cultures and says something about mm -hmm. her personality. She dared not meet Frank's eye as she sat down next to Richard. But a few minutes later, her guilt at abandoning Frank to Ingrid's earnest spirituality evaporated, carried away in the aromas of the steaming food she was being served. She bit into an onion pakoda, tore a piece from a light flaky roti, dipped the bread into a thick spicy curry, cooled her tongue on some cucumber yogurt, picked up a tender piece of fish with her fork. She felt a little spiritual herself, swept up in a kind of rapture at the intensity of flavors. How on earth can one country have so many wonderful foods, she gasped. You're asking me about good food, Richard said. I'm British, remember? <laughs> she laughed. London has some great restaurants. Yeah, and they're all Indian. <laughs> one of Ellie's older male students came to her table, carrying a large stainless steel tray full of glasses. You will have a lassie, miss, he asked. She took a long gulp of the cool yogurt drink. I think I'm having an out-of-body experience, she said. Easy there, Richard said. Your husband's boring holes into my back anyway. I wouldn't want him to think I'm the reason for this look of ecstasy on your face. <laughs> I like you, Richard. You remind me of my brother-in-law. Your brother-in-law is gay, Richard deadpan. Ellie spluttered, blowing Lussie out of her nose. Oh, stop. Look what you've made me do. She turned to him, a pleading look on her face. Can't you stay with us here in Gilbark? I can talk Sashi into giving you a really good rate at the hotel. Nandita, who was sitting at Richard's left, uh, turned toward them. What on earth are you two goosepussing about? She leaned over to face Ellie. Richard's going to kill you. Uh, Frank's going to kill you on your way home, darling. You pulled a really dirty trick on him. Ellie looked rueful. I know, but I can't deal anymore with stupid foreigners. She glanced at Richard. Present, present company accept, expe, accepted. Who are you calling a foreigner, you yank? My people were here in India while yours were, I know, swinging from trees. Something like that. Nice to hear you two imperialists arguing about your claims to India, Nandita said. Her tone was bemused, her eyebrows raised, and they all chuckled. Mm. A wonderful description. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. So this, this little section is from Watermarked, and it's uh, one character, Delta, is remembering her grandmother and the group of women with whom she gathers weekly to bake bread. So I'll read one little paragraph and then a, a longer section. Um, Hearing familiar, low-pitched voices, it was again for Delta an afternoon when she was nine, and the six women came to Nana's as they did each Saturday to bake. Loaves of wheat bread and rye bread began to expand in bowls, came out of the oven, cooled on racks. Knives tapped against the bottoms of pans to loosen the loaves, and utensils and containers were soaked and rinsed for reusing. It seemed as if they were growing bread, all those hands of di different browns dusted in flour. Then skipping ahead. At some point, Nana would start the singing. She would begin by clapping and humming, and then a few words blossomed into a hymn or a work song or a shout. The others would join in one by one until the place was vibrating with everywhere they'd been that week and there was no stopping between songs. Their voices rolled from one melody into the next. And Delta liked to wind among the women and make white flower clouds with her clapping hands. Those women had referred to their Saturday afternoon activity as a task that had to be done. They worked hard to bake the bread that would feed their families in the coming week and the loaves that would go the next day to church, mixing and kneading and lining them up as they came out of the oven and putting aside the rising dough to be carried home for baking. But it was their communion time and they would never have given it up. As they finished, they washed up and straightened the room, leaving it as it had been when they arrived. They took their aprons off and thanked Nana for her kitchen and their time together and said goodbye until the next morning at church. Nana would begin their cherished prohibition toast before they left. Well, she'd say, picking up her glass, here's to lying, cheating, stealing, and drinking. 
and the bread ladies would gather around the table laughing and lift their mugs of wine, all except for Valentine, who stood with the group, even though she refused to drink. The others would pick up the next three lines. Lie only to save a friend, one would say, and then another would add, cheat death, and they would all respond with amen. Steal the heart of the one you love, a third would contribute, and then Nana would finish as they clink glasses and drink only with the best of friends, reaching out to embrace each one of them with her working, praising hands. It was to those hands, injured so long ago that she never even talked about it, that Delta had always turned. Dolores' hands had been there, plaiting and arranging and cleaning, doing for her daughters in a consistent daily way, even though the person connected to them had seemed ever distant. But Nana's fingers, warm and receptive, had kept something within their lives vital. They had made a circle of women happen, and they had made bread rise. Mm -hmm. You all just you pull us right into the world through the descriptions, and it's so specific. And uh, when I read your works, I'm, I'm surprised over and over at how connected I feel to the characters and how moved by them, because the events and circumstances are so new to me. So I wonder if we could talk a little bit about, um, to play off one of your titles, 3D, the space between us, um, in the sense that how is it that you are able as a writer to bring readers in to a new experience um, that uh, connects them to something uh, that's already within themselves. I think a lot of uh, readers expect there to be very little space between the writer and their characters. Um, they might imagine that your works are autobiographical, especially the more vivid the descriptions or uh, you know, the more personal that it seems to them. And yet I think it's important to understand these spaces in that sense. Um, anyone care to, to comment on that? Well, I, I, I guess um, I would say that the facts of your own experience are, are your point points of departure for writing mm -hmm. fiction, you know, that you use something you know about, mm -hmm. about the world that you mm -hmm. share with the character, but then, but then your job as a fiction writer is to imagine it into something else, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, um, and that's actually one of the hard things for students, you know, in a, in a workshop, they'll say, but it really happened that way, you know, like, well, <laughs> <laughs> but that's only your beginning point. Yeah. Somehow, you know, then you, that's your jumping off mm -hmm. point, and I guess the challenge is to draw on on what you know about that emotional experience, mm -hmm. if, or, you know, if you have had the, the actual experience, mm -hmm. then, that, then that's something different. But I think often we haven't, and, mm -hmm. and so you know something. I don't know. In the, um, in the scene I read last night about um, the beating that Vesta's mother is running from, mm -hmm. you know, that didn't happen to me. But, but, I, do, but I was a little girl who lay in bed wondering how um, my father's uh, footsteps would sound as he hit the porch mm -hmm. and, 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 and wondering if he would be sober or not. You know, so I, I pulled on that, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and became that, that same little mm -hmm. girl. And so I guess that's what I think, you know, that's what the process is. Right. So mm -hmm. you close this, this space between you and the character in that way. Mm -hmm. I think it's really, uh, this is something I always tell my students, that, that simply describing something, um, you know, because it happened in real life, does not make for literature. Mm -hmm. I mean, just an accurate depiction of real life mm -hmm. is not literature. Uh, literature is description plus mm -hmm. that intangible quality. Mm -hmm. Call it magic, call it art, call it mm -hmm. craft, but it has to be something else. You have to take a real story and turn it into, you have to craft it in yeah. some way in order mm -hmm. for it to be appealing for somebody mm -hmm. to read. Um, you know, having said that, I mean, all of us, I'm sure, have borrowed from not just our own lives, but frankly, from the lives of the people we know. I mean, we've all heard stories, and at some point, I mean, the weight of heaven, the entire premise for the for the book, you know, this thing of this American couple landing in India as a way of trying to heal from this tremendous loss that they've suffered, uh, came about because uh, I was at one of these uh, book festivals, mm -hmm. and this woman came up to me and told me this really powerful story about mm -hmm. something that had happened to her. Now, I can, I can almost guarantee you that if she reads this book, she will not recognize her story mm -hmm. in this book. It's mm -hmm. not like I've lifted mm -hmm. you know, a stranger's story. Right. But there was just enough there that two years later, 
that story mm -hmm. was still in my mind in some yeah. shape or form, right. and and it became sort of the kernel mm -hmm. that I needed yeah. to launch into you know completely fictional yeah. story. Right. Maybe so. the difference is that you, as a writer, recognize what is it about the story that is that is connective, yes. that is mm -hmm. non specific yes. to a particular person yeah. and, and to extract that truth. You're mm -hmm. always looking for stories that have, as you said, that connective tissue yeah. that, that links mm -hmm. me to you and the characters to each other and hopefully to the readers, mm -hmm. yes. And there, there's just something universal about, you know, whether it's loss or grief or, mm -hmm. or love. Um, mm -hmm. Everybody experiences it regardless right. of who you are, where you come from. And that is what we're doing as writers. We're pulling on those universal truths mm -hmm. and, you know, putting that in a character and telling that mm -hmm. character's story. Right. Um, you know, there are lots of things that I haven't experienced. Um, you know, this book is about a young woman who loses her child. And, you know, I'm not a mother, mm -hmm. but I, I have lost other things. I mean, right. it might be a, a small toy, but, you know, I can recreate that grief mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that, you know, something that meant something to me and not no, no longer having it. I can mm -hmm. recreate that and, you know, massage that into something else. And that is what we all do. Yeah. We pull from other experiences to create something else in fiction. Right, right. And then with the specificity, mm -hmm. you make it, I mean, it's, you know, yeah, you yeah. make it, yeah, interestingly yeah. enough, yeah. or paradoxically, you make it universal with mm -hmm. the specificity right. because it isn't an abstract thing. Yeah. It's happening right. to it's somebody. It's empathy and compassion, you yeah. know, mm -hmm. those are the two things mm -hmm. you absolutely need, I think, to be a successful writer. Mm -hmm. you know? I've, you know, I've heard writers say that they leave might leave the specifics out in order to leave space for a reader to insert mm -hmm. themselves. But what I'm seeing here is, is sort of a, a completely different aesthetic of, right. again, that, that pulling in through the, through mm -hmm. the specificity. Right. Um, a very quick question, maybe yes or no for you as we wind up. Is the writing life a lonely life? No. In a good way. <laughs> <laughs> I like solitude, so I mean, yeah, I don't, it's not problematic anyway, mm. but a long time. Um, I don't know. It's a rich life. Yeah. It's yeah. a very rich life. And it might be rich because it's lonely and it might be rich because I get to meet wonderful, you know, other people that <laughs> I wouldn't otherwise. But yeah. uh, it's a good life. Yeah. Mm. Well, there are times when a cabin in the woods with, you know, no running water and no um, electricity or no phones, you know, matters. And then there are other times when you just simply need to be around people because if you didn't have that time, we wouldn't have anything to write about. So, yeah. mm. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on Hoka Pulitzer's The Writing Life.